more example of how much this organization and this leadership appreciates Army history and scholarship. Now this new book by General John Brown, former chief of military history and my old boss, mentor, and friend, uh, is just one example of the scholarship produced by the Army Center of Military History. We, of course, well known for our official histories, uh, the Green Book series from World War II, the Black Books on the Korean War, and the, and the continuing struggle to chronicle the history of the Vietnam War, our, our most uh, controversial of wars recently. <laughs> but we also regularly produce studies on the contemporary Army to engage Army doctrine writers and thinkers and generate some initial perspectives on the recent past. Now, historians are generally very uncomfortable with the recent past. It's not old enough yet. The documents are not all available. Tempers are still sometimes high. Egos can still be in play. I know this is shocking, but it is possible with current events. It's hard to have perspective on events in which you participated. It also takes an exceptional talent to steer an objective course through these current events and still provide clear insight and unbiased, although invariably somewhat colored because we are products of our times, judgments on contemporary happenings. Uh, the famous comments by Chinese Premier Zhu Enlai, uh, his often misunderstood comments on when asked about the French Revolution. Supposedly, he stated it was too early to tell, uh, although in reality, the translator failed, and he really didn't understand the question, and he thought the question was about the 1968 French student riots, so that indeed was too early to tell. But still, it's now entered mythology as a cautionary note about being careful of the unknown impact of historic events into the future. Histories History professors, history students know that events as momentous as the French Revolution or even World War II take decades to play out. One can't know the future impacts or gain true perspective on events, often for generations. And even such smaller events, such as the transformation of the U.S. Army after the end of the Cold War and the accelerated and unplanned changes after the attacks of 9-11, cannot be captured in their entirety so soon after the fact. History takes time to mature, documents need to marinate, and historians need to weigh hundreds of factors to gain perspective, and that perspective only comes through time. Now, having said that, and provided all the necessary historic and historical cautionary notes, I think General Brown was the right man to prepare, to prepare this first draft of the history of the Army during some momentous times as it engaged in important restructuring and evolution. He has provided insight and perspective in an objective manner to those events during this period of time, and it is indeed a fine study, covering the initiatives of a generation of Army leaders who saw some of the future, sometimes only darkly, and tried with a measure of success to prepare the Army for the 21st century as best they could. Since the result appears to be the finest Army in the world today, it's hard to see that their efforts are not crowned with some measure of success. Well, let me introduce our panel, and we'll take this discussion further, and I hope to still leave some time for discussion uh, right there at the end. I'm in the enviable position of introducing individuals uh, to whom this audience already is well known. I've already mentioned General Brown, former Chief of Military History, Armor Officer, 266 Armor Battalion Commander in Desert Storm, and later 2nd Brigade Commander of the 1st Cavalry Division. He's also a professional historian with a PhD from Indiana University, and both professions, soldier and scholar, make him the ideal writer for this particular volume of the Army's history. Next, we have General William Hartzog, commissioned from the Citadel in 1963, and whose last command from 1994 to 1998 was as the Commanding General of Training and Doctrine Command, and as the CG of the Army's premier organization devoted to training and new doctrine. General Hartzog was in the middle of many of these transformative events in the 90s, and I look forward to his comments on the exciting period in Army history that we'll be covering. He is joined by former Sergeant Major of the Army, Robert Hall, whose service to the nation began in 1968 at beautiful Fort Bragg, North Carolina, a post remembered, if not loved, by all of us. Uh, you can probably still smell the pine straw upon occasion uh, from all the push-ups you did there in basic training, um, who, but who also served in the 24th Infantry Division as Commandant of the 24th NCO Academy and then during Desert Storm as Command Sergeant Major of the 24th Division Artillery, and of course as Sergeant Major of the Army from 1997 to 2000. And finally on the panel we have Dr. James Carafano of the Heritage Foundation. Jim is a retired officer and well-respected commentator on the Army and the National Security Establishment writ large. He has P his PhD from Georgetown, has taught history at the U.S. Military Academy, 
and is a longtime friend of the Center of Military History and the historical profession in the Army. I cannot think of a finer panel to provide comments and insights on the Army of the period covered by Kevlar Legions, 1989 to 2005, than the one assembled here today. And so I'd like to begin by turning the floor over to General Brown, unless we have any additional comments, sir? General Sullivan? No? Sir? And uh, please wait for any questions until all the panelists have finished their presentations, and then we'll begin the discussion from there. John? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to add my thanks uh, to Richards for everybody for coming out, and it's great to see so many old friends here in the audience. Uh, you know, living in Colorado, you don't see much of a number of you guys, and it's good to, it, it's good to be back and see you. That's not that I welcome driving in D.C., but I do welcome <laughs> being here in the middle of D.C. Uh, I'd like to, you know, add some special thanks to some folks who are here who are absolutely instrumental in the project. Uh, Richard has mentioned uh, General Sullivan, who read every word and has been an active supporter and sponsor of history in general, but of this project in particular. Uh, General Nelson, uh, my predecessor once removed as Chief of Military History, also suffered through every word of the manuscript and uh, been very helpful in that. Uh, General Stroop has done so much to put me in contact with the people that you see in the footnotes and in the bibliography uh, and has enormously enriched uh, the resources I had available. And Secretary Les Brownlee, who's here, uh, uh, always a friend of history throughout the, uh, uh, my tenure, but uh, gave me many a session that was either a counseling session or a, uh, or, or, or a get-together uh, during his tenure, uh, which, which overshadowed, overarched with mine by, for so many years. Uh, and I'm glad you made him argue. Thank you very much. Good to see you. my sister-in-law, uh, you know, and my wife, my severest critic. They're they're here as well. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I thought I should start by defining army transformation uh, as the term is used in the book. Uh, that there are arguments for any number of different definitions. This is the one that I came to. Uh, in green, I kind of highlight the, the the things that one might flag up. Centrally directed in that five chiefs of staff in a row sought. Uh, to direct and manage a meaningful movement into the information age by the virtue of processes that they would control. Uh, institutionally driven in that your customary uh, TRADOC, AMC, DESOPS, and others who are at play uh, with respect to issues that relate to modernization or relate to force transformation were actively involved in directing this program, assisted from time to time by such temporary organizations as the LAM Task Force uh, or the Objective Force Task Force. Uh, a revolution in military affairs. Uh, the vision was always grand. Uh, the term revolutionary in, uh, in military affairs was not much used within the Army because it had acquired a lot of baggage and the Air Force had kind of taken proprietorship for the term. Uh, and so uh, the, there, there was a certain uh, tendency not to go in front of a penny-pinching Congress and say, uh, I know you're trying to save money, but we want a revolution in military affairs. You had to use your terms more carefully. Uh, but whenever you talk to the individual involved, the leap they envisioned was grand. Uh, it, it was revolutionary. Uh, it was to be comparable to the transition to uh, mechanized warfare in the middle of the 20th century. Obviously, information age technology was to be uh, capitalized upon, the Cold War, post-Cold War environment was to be adapted to, and you had ongoing defense uh, and joint efforts that you had to integrate your programs into. Uh, definition as depicted here is, is mine. I've, I've got no, I have no knowledge of anybody else who's agreed to it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, to this point, uh, you know, and part of this is salesmanship. Maybe I can get you guys to agree to it. Uh, but the, um, I, I had a briefing that as chief of military history, I trotted out that was called uh, Army Transformations Past. And, and I've inflicted it on many of the folks in this room. Uh, ultimately, it went to the entire Army staff. It was used uh, as a preface to sessions on transformation, sessions on the quadrennial review, and embedded in that briefing uh, were each of the notions I just described to you. And 
I never had any one uh, out of the uh, you know, scores of senior officers that I briefed disagree with the premise defined in this definition, which is to say no one disagreed that the leap was to be grand, that we were going to have a revolution in military affairs, that it was going to be centrally directed and institutionally driven. Uh, next slide. Uh, these, for historical purposes, would be army transformations past. When I was trying to analyze this particular army transformation, uh, these were the precedents uh, that I thought would be measured up to if this transformation itself were to qualify as both transformative and revolutionary. Uh, in each case, uh, these precedent uh, transformations were not about technology alone, which is a critical point. It, it was not just modernization. Uh, the first one, for example, Army for Empire. It is true that you had smokeless powder. It's true that you had uh, a usable machine gun. It's true that you had artillery hydraulics that allowed you to fire your artillery in a manner that you'd never been capable of before. Uh, you had the battleship. You did have technological innovations uh, that had the potential to carry you into a new era, but the technology alone didn't do it. Uh, there was also a huge socioeconomic change at the time. This was the period where industrial, uh, the industrial contribution to uh, our gross domestic product exceeded uh, agriculture for the first time. This was the time when cities became more populous than the countryside, when more people lived in the city than the countryside. So it, it was a time not just of technological change, it was of socioeconomic change, and it was also a change in our strategic posture. The Indian frontier was gone. Uh, we had leaped overseas. We had responsibilities in the Philippines and Cuba. Uh, and if you look through each of these other uh, transformations, you will find that in each case there was a technological change, but there was also a socioeconomic change, and there was a change in your strategic setting. Now, incidentally, you'll notice the temporal boundaries on this are kind of sloppy. Uh, like the Army for Empire, 1898 to 1941, it looks like it overlaps with uh, the mobilization-based army. Well, that, that's true. Uh, you transformation progresses in such a manner that you're more of one thing than you were of another over time. Uh, we kind of rehearsed the mobilization-based army in 1917, and then we walked away from it and went back to the Army for Empire until 1941. Then we became an army, uh, a mobilization-based army, uh, for real, for a long time, for a period of over a generation. Uh, next slide. Uh, I already spoke to you about transformation as a watershed event not being about technology alone, but also within uh, the Army, uh, transformation cannot be about technology alone either. Uh, and, and I've paraphrased here, borrowed heavily from General Vono's imperatives, those of you of a certain age you may remember when you had the card that had the army imperatives and you carried it in your wallet uh, and that was going to uh, refresh your memory uh, to the uh, you know to the fact that that, that that transforming an army was a broadly envisioned project not one that was narrowly envisioned well uh, you take the tank for example it wasn't enough to invent a tank you had to develop doctrine that allowed you to use it intelligently you had to come up with the organizations that embedded tank battalions and armored divisions and the matrix of capabilities that, that would allow you to use uh, this new uh, piece of equipment to maximum effect. You had all of the training that goes into both getting the gunnery of the crews to standard but also getting the maneuver training for the much more expansive uh, scope of your operations. Administrative practices to develop the logistical tail and to have the idea of a motor pool the idea of a maintenance program, the idea of supplies in classes one through nine. Uh, service culture. Uh, how many of you have qualified tank table eight or Bradley table eight? Yeah. 
Okay. Lately? Yeah. Uh, uh, well, it doesn't have to be lately, ever. Yeah. 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 I think you'll agree with me. It's not just a training event. Uh, there's, a, it, there's, there's a whole culture goes with it. You know, there's bore sighting. There's zeroing it. You're doing it by all of the steps. Your whole crew is involved. You write down your bore sight and zero, and you put it close to your heart so that you'll never lose it. Uh, you've bore sight at uh, 8 o'clock, and if you don't get to go down range by 9.30, you have to do it again because the sun's going to come out, and it's going to cause your gun to take you off the target. Uh, there's this, uh, this, this whole culture. You know, you have to wear your lucky socks that day. Uh, you, the company commander has to go down first because he has to lead the way. You know, so, you know, being a armor officer, being, uh, going through table eight it, is not just uh, an event. It, it, it's an expression of your culture. Uh, and if you don't think it's a cultural event, uh, try the guy who's been in the 82nd Airborne as a paratrooper all of his life who suddenly shows up in a Bradley battalion. And, 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 and it's an anthropological exercise as he uh, has to adapt from being a paratrooper to being a Bradley soldier. Uh, funding, uh, you do have to pay for it. And uh, the, um, you know, a, a vision without funding is, is called a hallucination. Yeah, yeah. And, and so you have to develop the, you know, the, the funding paradigms have always been part of a transformation. And a pattern that I think we'll come back to has been the one in which uh, you have an idea that translates into prototypical units that let you experiment and play. Uh, in the 1930s, for example, we did have mechanized uh, units, and we did experiment with the capabilities that the tank uh, and the armored car represented, but it was on such a small scale uh, that you never really had the army as a whole transforming you had this nascent idea that was being nurtured. And then all of a sudden, in uh, well, Marshall's expression, uh, in all of the pre-war years, uh, he'd had uh, all the time he wanted but no money. And then in 1941, beginning on December 7th, all of a sudden he had all the money he could possibly hope for, but no time. Fortuitously, the vision of what that money should be spent on had been matured in this intervening interwar process. And keep that model in mind when we come back to discussing Army Transformation 1989 through 2005. Um, next slide. Uh, these are the Army Chiefs of Staff during the era. Uh, I organized my book largely around their tenures. Uh, it's not just that it was a convenient four-year series of intervals that allowed you to space out the time. Uh, it's also, in a practical measure, the chiefs of staff, by the virtue of the organization, became the leaders within the organization who were most responsible for envisioning the future and carrying the Army towards it. Uh, the, uh, since the, the Goldwater Nichols, uh, we, we, we had been in a process where the wars overseas were to be led by the overseas commanders. Uh, the vice chief of staff largely since 1947 took over the responsibility for the day-to-day -day running of the Army, in particular the Army staff. The secretary and the secretariat were responsible for political top cover uh, and making sure that your relationship with your, you know, the, 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 the nation at large was, was, was uh, amicable. But it was the chiefs of staff who envision the future and in association largely, in particular with the TRADOC commanders and the AMC commanders, were the ones who carried the story forward. And fortuitously, the chiefs of staff and the TRADOC commanders tended to be kind of coterminous as well. Uh, and so this was a convenient organizing principle. But I would want to make the point that this doesn't in any mean, way mean that the chiefs were not autonomous, that they were not their own men. In, in each case, uh, you had difference. General Sullivan's land task force in Force 21 was different than General Reimer's variant of Force 21 or his army after next and uh, General Shinseki's objective force uh, or Schoemaker's future force. And in the book I go into 
the differences and nuances. But for those differences, the arc, the trajectory, had far more in common uh, than it did uh, different. Uh, and the vision uh, that the LAM task force came up with uh, in the course of the early 1990s was essentially the trajectory that we followed all the way through uh, what I believe is the fruition uh, of the modernized, digitized Army uh, in 2005. And I'll get to that in just a minute. Um, there is also, incidentally, a certain apostolic secession here. Uh, General Sullivan was the desops to General Vono and then his vice. Uh, General Reimer was the desops to Vono and then the vice and the Borscom commander to Sullivan. Uh, General Shinseki was the desops to Reimer and then the vice uh, to uh, Reimer as well. Uh, the one break in that chain, in theory, would be General Schoomaker. And, and some argue uh, that um, there was a conscious effort to try to break the chain of continuity by the virtue of picking an outsider, but also by having an underlap, uh, and that that was the first time in our history that we'd ever been without a chief of staff for an appreciable period of time and without a secretary of the Army. Fortuitously, as General Brown, I mean, as uh, Secretary Brownlee can tell us, uh, we, we had uh, an acting secretary and a vice that stepped up to the plate and carried us through that very difficult period ably and well. And, and General Schoomaker proved to be uh, a man willing to listen. And even though he hadn't had the same uh, background as his predecessors, uh, I argue that he listened, he bought into the program as it existed. He aligned himself with the trajectory the program was on, and he took advantage of the huge infusion of funds after 2003 to bring Army transformation to its logical fruition and to give us the digitized ex Expeditionary Army that we had been working towards so long. Uh, next slide. Uh, these are characteristics uh, of the Army as it ended up the uh, Army of 2005, and, and this is my basic argument that you really are talking about a change. Uh, let me not talk about the first. Let's go to standing versus mobilization based. Uh, we were experiencing, uh, it, it was clear that downsizing was inevitable. We saw this as early as 1987. Uh, we knew that the Cold War was going to wind down, that there was going to be a huge downsizing. Our traditional formula for downsizing had been to skeletonize the Army. Uh, and to have uh, a, a, a mobilizable capability in which you had a large number of units, uh, each of which were less capable in an immediate sense, but would produce the framework within which you would mobilize and absorb replacements and all of that. Uh, General Vono launched uh, Project Vanguard, Project Quicksilver, uh, Antaeus. Each of these were considered deliberations to try to get ahead of this inevitable you know, uh, development, uh, doing it kind of secretively, but trying to figure out what the Army should look like in the aftermath. And the consideration was have the Army standing and ready to go. Uh, we don't have a near peer adversary. We don't have anybody that we're going to fight on the scale that we fought the Soviets. But we are going to be going all over the world on short notice to fight uh, small contingencies and, and to deal with lesser opponents and we've just got to be ready. And so we became a standing army, not a mobilization-based army. And the reserve component initially was supposed to be that hedge against mobilization, but as we found the reserve component itself is now an operational force. I mean, it goes uh, at a different uh, cycle uh, of force generation in the army, but it's there uh, as often as the active component is uh, and a major fraction of your force structure is always reserve components. So we are a standing army now, not a mobilization-based army. That's a big difference. Uh, expeditionary. Uh, we knew that we were going to be in the United States and we were going to try to get other places. This led to an expansion, uh, you know, three, three initiatives. One was to expand sea lift and air lift. Uh, one was pompous prepositioning. Uh, one was to lighten the load. Uh, if you take a look at Desert Shield and compare it with Desert Storm, uh, you'll find in both cases the 101st came out of Fort Campbell, the 82nd came out of Fort Bragg, 
the 24th and then the 3rd came out of Stewart. Uh, the uh, first cab with the fourth came out of Hood. Uh, the third ACR came uh, at Bliss. No, yeah. Carson. Yeah. But in each case, it was the same units coming from the same places 15 years apart. If you make your comparisons, uh, you'll remember that at, in Desert Storm, the great anomaly, the great fear, the great um, uh, anxiety was over what we called having the 82nd out as speed bumps, and that was a term that the 82nd used. They believed that they'd been put into Iraq, that they had a capability to delay, but they didn't have a capability to stop their opponent. Uh, you go 15 years later, and the first guys on the ground have arrived at about the same pace that the 82nd did, but they landed on Pompkiss equipment that was pre-positioned. They had been trained to get from the airport to the field in 12 hours, and within that 12 hours, drawing their equipment, de developing their, uh, you know, a battle array, uh, deploying to the field, and being fully equipped, ready to go. Redcon one, we call it, and they did it in 12 hours. And so, uh, you had uh, an armor force on the ground in less time than you'd been able to put an airborne brigade on the ground uh, 15 years earlier. Uh, with respect to sea lift, you had the fourth division at sea almost immediately. The 101st Airborne took one month to get everything overseas uh, the second time. The first time it had taken three. So if you do any kind of comparison, I think you, you, you find that the Army of uh, 2003 was far more expeditionary uh, than the Army of 1990, and that's not in any way to denigrate the accomplishment of Desert Shield. Uh, you know, that was the fastest we'd ever moved forces on that scale ever. It's just we were much better 15 years later because we'd continued to change. Uh, one thing about airlift, the C-5 was an exponential uh, increase in our capability of airlift and it was uh, enabled you to take armor units and land them on austere airfields to bring tanks into places like Bashir Airfield in northern Iraq. If you take a look at uh, Iraqi freedom, you'll find that every light unit out there, 173rd Airborne, uh, 101st, 82nd, uh, the special forces operating in, in Mosul, they all had a tank company or tank battalion with them, and in many cases supplied by C-5. If you have a little armor and your opponent has none, that gives you a huge advantage. Uh, incidentally, um, uh, I can remember General Keene at one of our staff meetings commenting on the fact that they'd landed a special forces team in northern Iraq because the 4th Infantry Division was supposed to come through. 4th Infantry Division was bobbing around out in the water because it couldn't get uh, permission from Turkey to come through. They decided to reinforce the special forces team so they launched the 173rd Airborne and then they launched a tank battalion and they put it all in by C-5 and his comment was it was like re reinforcing a SEAL team uh, with a carrier battle group, you know, I mean, by the time you had the SEAL, you know, the, the special forces operating team that had uh, a, a, a force uh, a, a hundred times its firepower and a dozen times its strength, you know, that, that was delivered on short notice because we were an expeditionary army. Uh, one aspect also, of course, was lightening the units that were to deploy. In uh, Iraqi freedom, the second ACR actually got on the ground, was Humvee mounted, and ended up responsible for 200 miles of real estate uh, that it secured with javelins, which are a much advanced uh, anti-tank capability, and, uh, you know, the various improvements uh, both in its own organic capability and the capability of the aviation that was supporting it. And so you had a light unit that came in quickly and had enormous capabilities that wouldn't have existed sometime before. Uh, digitized. Uh, General Hartzog is more familiar than any man in this room, maybe any man in the world, with, with uh, NTC Rotation 9706, uh, a watershed event in which we first put a brigade, uh, digitized brigade into the field and tried to work out what the capabilities needed to be. Uh, the questions that he proposed were, where am I? Uh, where are my buddies? Where is the enemy? Uh, if you believe that you can answer those three questions more effectively uh, and you have a tenfold capability in the precision with which you answer them, 
intrinsically, you've got a revolution in military affairs. Uh, just that information multiplies your capabilities exponentially. Uh, those of us a certain age can remember when it was always a rule of the thumb that you always had one platoon in the battalion lost. There's always, there was always some. Sometimes it was a company, but, 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 but more often it was a platoon. And so if you were a battalion commander, you're a battalion type, there was always somebody who was lost, and you were on the radio, uh, you know, X-ray 3, 4, where are you? Yeah. Well, it's big hill in front of me and trees in the back, and, and you're trying to figure out where he is, and he's trying to figure out where he is, and he's trying to exchange information with you. A mess truck, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yes, sir. Yeah, that. Yeah, the you know the 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 log pack that never found its way to you in the dark. I mean, that was a, you know a staple uh, for maneuvers. And this, of course, when you were at Hohenfels and Grafenry and you'd been there 20 times before, uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, it, it, you know, everybody's got a GPS now. In Desert Storm, a few people had a GPS. Now everybody has a GPS. Uh, in the book, uh, I, I open up with the comparison of the Battle of Talafar in uh, 2004 uh, with Mogadishu in 93. Uh, and of course, Mogadishu, Black Hawk down, uh, extremely brave men under very trying circumstances, but you nevertheless have a major fraction of everybody lost uh, and, and not knowing where they are and not knowing how to navigate the streets and not knowing what the neighborhoods look like. Uh, you come to Telafar and you've got these downloadable maps and people are looking at it and figuring out where they are. They know precisely where they are. Uh, they have the uh, helicopter that went down still on the screen. They're able to find the helicopter uh, immediately and get to that location. And you also, if you read the accounts in uh, some of the urban fighting in Iraqi freedom, encounter an a, a, a anomaly that hadn't existed before. The American soldiers on the ground who are the... Uh, outsiders are more familiar with the terrain than the guerrillas or the insurgents who are fighting them. Because if the insurgents came in Baghdad from a neighborhood other than the one that was being fought over, uh, they had no particular familiarity with the layout of the streets. They had no particular familiarity with the locations. And yet the in troops that were fighting, the American troops, almost inevitably did, uh, particularly if they'd been there a day or two and just had a capability to orient themselves. And, and, and this, you know, this digitized capability of the soldier is the equivalent to your, you know, younger generation, the 20-year-olds, the showing up at the airport and having no idea where they're going and not bothering to take a map, but they just pull out their garment and type in an address and they follow it. Whatever she has to say, they do, and they get there, you know. Uh, you know, and, and uh, th that's, you know, that's digitization. Where am I? Where are my buddies? Uh, an even more critical question. Uh, Desert Storm uh, was a huge success, but one of the most harrowing aspects of it was the incidence of fratricide. And in the aftermath of Desert Storm, there was an enormous effort. Uh, involving uh, all layers of the army, but particular those who had uh, participated in events involving fratricide, to come to grips uh, with both the phenomena and how it is you dealt with it. Uh, one line of experimentation was along the lines of through sight video, having some kind of capability uh, to look through uh, a scope and see whether or not it was a good guy or a bad guy. Uh, another guy, you know, another approach uh, was to have knowledge uh, of the location, you know, what, what's called blue force tracking. Uh, in a uh, quick anecdote, how am I doing on time, Richard? Perhaps another five, sir. Five minutes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because my, my wife is making all <laughs> kinds of expressions at me, and I know that's got to be that I'm running out of time. Okay. Good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, I'll... Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll wrap it. I'm very sorry. I, I, I apologize. You just get excited. You know, write 600 pages and you get excited, you know, and you want to get it all out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to the same audience. Um, I, I think everybody's familiar with the incident at Safwan uh, in Desert Storm where the uh, General Schwarzkopf had directed that uh, Safwan intersection be secured by and, and intended to put down a, um, 
uh, a tent there that was going to be the place where all the peace parleys took place and where, you know, you had the iconic event where the war ended by the virtue of the Iraqis having the peace terms dictated to them. Uh, General Frank's uh, instructions as he understood them uh, was to deny the area to the enemy. Uh, so, you know, he did it by intercepting with helicopters to make sure that it wasn't available. So the tent was supposed to go down in, in, in the middle of an area the uh, Iraqis were actually in. Uh, Tony Marino had the good sense to go up and bully him off to the, uh, off the site even after the, uh, uh, you know, even after the, um, peace, the, the, the ceasefire was in effect. But one headquarters didn't know where the other headquarters was, didn't know where the units were. Nobody knew that there were no American forces on Safwan. Similar incident, similar time, uh, you know, in, in uh, Iraqi freedom. And you had the occasion where uh, the Karbala Gap was breached. Uh, Franks, Fred, no, this is Tom Franks, noticed that there was a, a blue icon, a, a, you know, well into Iraqi territory, was concerned that it was isolated and going to be overrun. Talked to McKernan, uh, General McKernan said, you know, dial up your uh, resolution one level dialed up the resolution and showed all the other formations that were going through so it wasn't an isolated unit, it was a breakthrough. I mean, it was a spearhead. It was Karbala Gap had been penetrated, and it was immediately visible. But the most telling thing about the incident was you didn't have uh, Franks and McKernan following up to call the local commander and say, you know, where are your units, Who are you? you know, what's this unit that's out in front, who's with them, how many people are, there wasn't this enormous traffic back and forth to try to figure out the information or detail. The command that was clean, because everybody could immediately see where things were and where they were going. Uh, our Army is brigade based, it's unit manned, uh, and centered on the combat spectrum, the point I'm making there is that by and large, we've designed a force that uh, optimizes in mid and high intensity conflict, but is capable of adapting itself to either the low end or the high end of the combat spectrum. And, and that's kind of uh, where we've ended up. Right now, we are adapting to the low end of the combat spectrum, but our, our, our best measure of uh, capability and success is, remains mid-intensity and high-intensity conflict, and it may be a philosophical argument as to whether or not that's the way it should be. Uh, next slide. Uh, I think our topic is extremely relevant uh, because I think that right now we're about where we were in 1989, uh, we as an Army. And so if we want to figure out how we adapt to the circumstances that are emerging, we have to ask ourselves, uh, do we have a war that's winding down? Uh, are we about ready to experience another episode of congressional parsimony? Are we going to downsize? And is somebody going to tell us, we're never going to do that again. We're never going to fight a ground war again. That was ugly. We don't like, we're not going to do that. Uh, is there a fascination with kind of a techno-aerial solution, doing something that's bloodless in, in, in order to win? Uh, is there some kind of technological watershed that we're seeing? Is there something that's a fool of digitization? that's coming up? I say yes. I say that robotics are now at about the level of that digitization was then. And I think we will continue to play out digitization and our digitized capabilities will considerably increase over time. We'll get better and better at it. But that won't be a transformative event. Uh, if we take robotics and we integrate them into our army and our doctrine or organization, uh, that might be a, a, um, uh, a transformative event. Are we at a geostrategic watershed? Uh, I think we may be. Uh, are we at a socioeconomic watershed? Uh, that's more of a matter of debate. I think we are, but I don't have time to make that case right now. Uh, yeah, maybe later uh, I I'll talk to you about the social trends I see playing out now that are equivalent to the socioeconomic change that uh, underpin uh, each of our earlier transformations. Uh, last slide. Um, within the course of our uh, conversation, uh, I, I think there have been lessons learned from the experience of the last 20 years 
uh, that apply next. Uh, thought first comes. You know, th you know, thought comes first. So you need to think first. You need to be. You, you need to think before you leap. And I think a example early on is I mentioned to you earlier Vanguard and Antaeus and Quicksilver. Uh, rather than being bullied into downsizing by external forces without having a plan, we planned ahead so that uh, when we were forced to, we were at least able to guide the course of events. Uh, emphasize analysis and precedent. One of the Army's strongest suites in four QDRs running has always been the energy that we've applied to the teams that we invested in the project of the Quadrennial Review. Because of those capabilities, time and again we've dodged the bullet uh, of someone who wanted to take a couple of divisions off the force structure. Uh, and it wasn't that we were playing games, it was just we were making our capabilities and the nation's needs perfectly clear by the process, by the virtues of, uh, of thoughtful analysis. Consensus counts. After you've come to a determination, you need to get everybody aboard. Uh, anticipate distractions. Uh, General Sullivan, in his opening speech, uh, made the case that there would be no time out for readiness, uh, that, that you weren't going to have the opportunity to set aside uh, the Bosnias or the Somalias or the Hades or, or, or the Aberdeen sex scandals or any of these other um, events that come up and take care of your supervisory time and talent. Uh, you have to work your way through them. And because there are going to be distractions, you have to organize yourself in such a manner that somebody is keeping their ball on, uh, their eye on transformation at the same time that you uh, are uh, dealing with the distraction. Address doctrine, organization, training, administrative practice, and service culture. You, 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 again, as Vono pointed out 20 years ago, it's a package deal. You have to do it all. And finally, think your way through the funding. Uh, the money is always the hardest part to get lined up and get right. Uh, in each of the transformations passed to include this one, uh, there's been a period of formulation in which prototypical units and experimental efforts and uh, a, 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 a appreciation in a small scale of the technologies and, and the uh, organizations that were going to fight future wars were brought to maturity and then something happened that caused all of the funding to become available and all of a sudden you had this huge increase in your capabilities to fight the war that you'd envisioned. Uh, in the case of Iraqi Freedom, we went from having a thousand units, a thousand vehicles digitized to having 58,000 in a very brief period of time. We became a digitized army almost overnight from the point of view of having the idea and the equipment to having everybody equipped and capable with the idea and the equipment. And that's not just something the Army can do. That requires our industrial colleagues to be ready to produce at the point in time that the money becomes available. It's a you know, twin thing. It's, it's like the supply sergeant uh, every annual year in closeout. You always have to have a long euphor list. You always have to be ready because the moment money is available, you want to be able to spend it intelligently and quickly. And, and that's where I characterize this as needing to strategize on. I'm sorry I took so long. I'm sorry we're just a tad incoherent, but I've come across much better in writing <laughs> than I do in person. <laughs> and so if you'll get a copy of the book, uh, I think you're going to give folks copies of the book. Are gratuitous? I, I am, sir. I don't want yeah. them to rush yeah. for them right now, though. Yeah, don't rush to them right now, but but uh, you, you'll, you'll find I'm better in writing than I am in person. Thank you, Thank you very much. And now uh, General Hartzog, uh, who was at the center as TRADOC commander of many of the transformation debates and changes of the Army during this uh, early, the critical period of the 90s. Sir? I'll do this in uh, five minutes or less if I can. Um, three weeks ago, I was at Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, 32 men who served in a company I commanded in 1967 wanted a reunion, and I was honored that uh, they wanted me to be there, and I did. The current unit of Charlie Company, 4th Battalion of the 23rd Infantry, is a striker outfit. 
and they really did it up well. They took a list of every one of the 32 of us who were there from 45 years ago and meted the person who was in that position today with them for the day. If any of the old soldiers here ever have a chance to do that, you must do it. You do it for several reasons. In the first place, I got a perspective of the difference between the modern volunteer army and the draft army that many of us were a part of, and it was a glorious time. But I thought in the middle of that, I was out uh, firing weapons on the range after having bumped along in Stryker for about an hour. And uh, something that uh, General Sullivan taught me um, through the many years that I worked for him and, and have ever since um, came back. And he, and he said, and by the way, it was my 70th birthday the day before that last. Uh, and he said uh, somewhere along the way, um, as you grow older, you have clearer and clearer visions of things that never were. <laughs> so uh, I'll try to keep those uh, tamped down this afternoon. I entered this transformation fray in 1989 as the assistant commandant at Fort Benning. I have a vivid memory of trying to take an aviator's helmet with a uh, pull-down screen and turn it into something that a ranger could use on patrol. And we invented six of these helmets, gave them to six of the rangers. They worked with them for two weeks, and then I had to put two people in the hospital with claustrophobia. Mm -hmm. Experiments are interesting things. Uh, after uh, having the privilege of uh, being the J3 in Just Cause on page 50 of John's terrific book, um, that's my baseline. And... If you enter the, today what we call the information-enabled world or the digital world, in uh, 1989, I entered a command post, and what I have a vision of was a very noisy place with total confusion and a ringleader named Max Thurman trying to run it all from the center. Uh, so uh, it was not an orderly, efficient place is in spite of the fact that we tried to do the best we knew how to do. Uh, later was a uh, commander in, in Panama and in the 1st Division and spent a, a tour with the Navy and the Atlantic Command and then became the TRADOC commander. And I have another vivid memory of uh, General Thurman saying, come to a meeting in the Pentagon in the old chief's conference room, or the, I guess it was the secretary's conference room, I've got a little project and you're gonna be involved in it. So I came in this room and I found all the staff there and the chief at the head of the table, not really knowing what I was doing there. And I left that uh, room some staggering two hours lady, later as his executive agent for the experimentation to implement or try to, to implement some of the hypotheses that he had about the future of the, of the Army. And um, one of them was that if you could answer those three questions that John just talked to, that you could increase things like the breadth of influence of a given unit, maybe double it, to uh, line up uh, strategic, operational, and tactical collection capabilities for intelligence, to go from reactive to anticipatory things and all of the subsets of each of those things. It was about trying to have some high percentage of any force know where they were at the time, where their subordinates were at the time, and to the best of possibilities where the enemy was at the time. When I was with my 32 brothers from 1967, we threw a bunch of stuff on the table that we had brought from Vietnam. One of the things was a 1 over 25,000 pictographic map. Some of you remember those things. It was an anathema to us because it was totally green, totally green with a grid on top of it. So if you wanted to know where you were, you fired a height of burst and hope it was in front of you and not behind you. Frequently it was behind you. Where am I? We didn't know where we were a lot of the time, unless you had techniques and procedures that helped you do it. This was an army thing. 
You need to remember that in this period, from about 91 on, after the fall of the wall, the chief was beset with the, with the challenge of drawing the army down from about 880,000 to some 500,000. That could have been the downtime of that period in our history, if he had let it be. But he didn't. He was uh, wise enough to say, we need something that will take the chart up and to the right, even though the, the numbers are going down and to the right. He drew that chart a number of times. All of us who were his lieutenants got real familiar with it. Because what he wanted was the intelligence and the energy of the Army leadership involved in this future effort. How do we get there? Uh, I had the privilege of being uh, his mechanic for that. Um, a number of people participated in sub-experiments at small levels to develop and to test these hypotheses. Some worked extraordinarily well. Some worked extraordinarily poorly, as you might ex I mean, I I'll cover one of those. But after two or three years, we put these together and built up a brigade at uh, Fort Hood, Texas, the 4th Infantry Division, that was a digitized brigade. They had time to experiment, to train, and to find out things that worked and didn't work, and then we ran this exercise and, uh, that he was talking about. It went on later, and the experimentation ended as a division exercise in 2001 with Ben Griffin and the 4th Division doing it. I have the privilege of being invited to that and seeing what had occurred. Uh, so what about all of that? Well, there are a few things I learned. Experimentation is difficult. And failure is often as, as or more important than success. All of us who are soldiers in this room were trained to go out and be successful. That was the gold standard. Make it work. Well, if you try really hard on something, a piece of equipment, a piece of doctrine, an organization, and it doesn't work and you can figure out why it didn't work, it may be more valuable lesson than if you force it to an, an awkward or unaffordable success. I learned that. Second, and I think the Sergeant Major will cover this, it's all about soldiers. It always has been, it probably always will be. I remember getting into a tank on about the second week of beginning of this uh, 1997 exercise, and the tank commander was um, grimy. I mean, he had been at this for eight straight days. Um, he had sweated through the uniform, hadn't bathed in a whole bunch of time. I knew he was there, by the way. Uh, you, you knew it before you got in the tank. But at any rate, I was chatting with him about the, the applique things that he had, and I said, what do you think all of this? And he said, I, I, I don't know how to use it all yet. I'm working on that, but I sure don't want to go back to a tin can and a piece of wire. Uh, we all contribute at certain times in the Army. We're looking at a piece of time. A lot of that has stuck, but uh, frankly, our capabilities move on, our challenges move on, and so I was proud to be a, a mechanic and a part of, uh, of the Chief's uh, dawn and prototype of all of this in this era. And um, I could probably talk for three hours, but I didn't write the book. John did. It's a great book. He's got it. It's accurate. Um, I told him maybe there was 9 or 10 percent I would argue about, and that was generally judgmental, but this is a great book for, for that particular era. John. Thank you. Second Major. Thanks, sir. Uh, when General Stroop called and says, hey, I want you to sit on the panel, I asked him, what do you want me to talk about? He said, about 15 minutes. Uh, after, after getting the PDF of the book and reading the book, I'm beginning to wonder why was I sitting here, but I do want to talk about it. Let me, t let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I didn't get to write any other book. I didn't get to, I'm not the architect of any of the strategies and anything in here about the strategic level. I was a non-commissioned leader during this entire time as a battalion sergeant major, an NCO academy commandant, a division sergeant major, an army sergeant major, a sergeant major of a unified command, and then sergeant major of the army. 
I served as Sergeant Major of the Army for two of the Chiefs of Staff on there with General Reimer for his last two years with General Sinsecki. Uh, during his first year, the only guidance I got from either one of those chiefs was to be with soldiers, to be a forceful advocate for soldiers, and keep my eye on the future. The future during my time as Sergeant Major of the Army was Force 21. It was Army after next, and it was the objective force. And, uh, and the time that we were there, my whole time from Battalion Sergeant Major up, we had a, we had a training system that provided confident, capable, confident non-commissioned officers to lead and supervise their soldiers. Uh, non-commissioned officers were the glue that kept the Army together as all the strategic plans were, were implemented, were executed. As we went through experimentations on all of it, it was non-commissioned officers who stayed in units, who progressed in units, who kept the faith, that allowed us, allowed the Army to accomplish the tremendous steps that's been taken. General Paul Kern and I walked over here this afternoon and we were laughing about our first GPSs in Desert Storm. The $3,000 GPS, the $800 Magellans, it'll give you a direction, uh, but you better watch out where the wadis are because there was nothing else out there that, that told you. Uh, we talked about that, but it, it was soldiers, and I, I think as you look at transformation in the Army, it, it's not specifically stated in here, but it's embedded throughout the book, the, the tremendous role of the non-commissioned officers, the tr soldiers, uh, the training that goes on, and also the tremendous support that's grown for the families. And, and I'd ask us to consider how far we've gone with with family support. I, I joined an army in 1968 that I thought the attitude of the army was if we wanted you to have a wife, we'd issue you one. I said that in Atlanta a couple of months ago to some health professionals and somebody sitting right up front says, oh no. I said, I don't know. You don't know what they was going to issue me. You know, it may be okay. But we went through those times my wife's not here this week, in case you were wondering. Very brave. Yeah. But we've gone through these times with, with the tremendous things. So I just want to say thanks that, that it, is, it is years ago that I hope you've forgotten about, sir. Uh, and it's my privilege today, if we, uh, if we get to the questions and answers, it's my privilege today to, to be the voice for those non-commissioned officers who and soldiers who, who serve, who continue to serve, who have worn and continue to have the privilege to wear the, the Army uniform. So I've, I've lived that role, and besides, I stayed at Holiday Inn Express last <laughs> night. So if you, have, if you have questions for me, I'll stand by to answer those after we're through.